All right, let's just go ahead and open up in prayer tonight. If you want to stand, we'll ask the Lord to bless the word, bless our understanding, uh, and bless our doing. Amen? Because we're to be doing the word, not just hearing the word and living the word. I mean, we're to be living the word and doing the word. Father, uh, we come to you tonight in Jesus' name, and we thank you uh, for this gospel. We thank you for the power of the blood that has cleansed us, and we thank you for the power of our prayers, yeah. that, Lord God, you respond to prayer, and you are a rewarder of those who seek you diligently. Amen. And so, Lord, as we continue seeking you, as we continue asking, as we continue praying uh, according to your will, Father, thank you these things are coming to pass, and thank you that we've not been working in vain. And I just pray tonight your wisdom, your knowledge, your blessing. Bless the word as it goes into the lives of all of us here and those that are listening online. And we bind the enemy who would come to steal seeds of truth. We thank you and give you all the praise and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we'll go ahead and have a seat and we'll just go ahead and start. All right. Something that's been on my heart and mind a little bit and I two days in a row I woke up just with this scripture and you may say well gee there's not much there in uh, Mark chapter 12 verse 34 the end of a discussion that Jesus had with one of the scribes or Pharisees he said thou art not far from the kingdom of God and I'd like to just say that as many people as you and I have talked to or talked to about the Lord or they've asked questions about the Lord, you'll remember that this was after Jesus had said about the, uh, he was being questioned about the man who died and left a wife with no children and then the brother married the wife and then the next brother married the wife because that one died also and then another brother married her because that one died and in the end, they said to Jesus, whose wife will she be in the end? And he told them, you don't understand the scriptures nor the power of God, and that in heaven we will be as the angels. And then he went on to talk a little bit more and it ended up about what is the first and the greatest commandment uh, was the question Jesus was asked, and he explained all of that. And in, as he explained, the, the man said to him, uh, you know, Master, you're a good teacher. You do speak truth and so on. Uh, of course, he didn't really maybe understand he's talking to God in the flesh. But anyway, so it says in verse 34, And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God, and no man after that, durst or would ask him any question and so you think about how many times you and I before we really had committed our lives and I've talked to a few folks lately who said you know I've never really committed myself the way you're talking about and what I hope I'm talking about is exactly what the scripture says and denotes about this commitment that we make to Christ and uh you know, give up our life to receive his life, as the scripture says, so that we were not far from the kingdom of God at one point in time in our own lives. And we may have asked some silly questions. We may have said, you know, some things that sounded pretty right. And if we were talking to somebody like uh, maybe a pastor somewhere or whatever, they might have said to us, you know, I, I, you're getting there, you're getting there. And that's somewhat what Jesus was say, saying in this. And I just thought of how many people over 40 some years or so for me and many of you some similar times and you've talked to folks and they've asked you good questions and honest questions and sincere things and proving that the Lord is working in all of this and working in people's lives. So he said, thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And if you're out there listening today, listen. You may be asking questions, 
You may be saying things like I said, I, I think I need to go to church. Uh, I would even be in parties and different things and say to my friends there, hey, we need to go to church because the Lord was drawing us toward the kingdom. And you may be experiencing some of the same things. It doesn't mean that your flesh isn't raging against you like let's party, let's go do this, let's go do that. But pay attention to the fact that God is trying to bring you in uh, so that you can experience eternal life and saving grace. And that's a blessing of God. And a lot of folks will say, well, if the Lord's coming, why hasn't he come? Listen, it may be for you that he hasn't come as yet because you can still come into the kingdom. And that's been our prayer uh, here at the church at Warren uh, for so many people and so many souls. So with that little bit said, let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 12 tonight. And you're familiar with this. But I want to throw a little pictorial in here. Um, probably would make a nice video if it could be done. But Hebrews chapter 12 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We're running a race. The Bible says that this Hebrews 11 and all the accounts of men of old that suffered things and went through things and fought battles and brought down kingdoms and saw their dead raised to life again and others who, it says, uh, wouldn't accept that resurrection. They wanted to go to the presence of the Lord. Uh, all through here, what they endured in verse 37 of chapter 11, sufferings and hardships. In verse 38, if they are accounted this way, somewhere in time, in the eyes of the Lord, you and I are going to be accounted in what it says in verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. Now that could sound very arrogant, and some people have um, lived an arrogant type lifestyle and, you know, carried themselves like that, that, you know, this world's not worthy of me. Well, listen, the only way that happens is that Christ really is alive in us and has taken over our life. We've yielded everything to him, and this world, what it means by that is the wickedness and the ugliness and the foulness of all these things of murders and atrocities and, you know, sacrifices of humans and various things. None of the world is worthy of these men that we read about. But if we will keep the faith to the end, if we will walk with the Lord, and of course our battles are not against the government out there or the nation over there or the king here or the ruler there, our battles are against principalities and powers, the rulers of darkness. Because can be that nobody is coming to your house and pounding on your door or trying to take your stuff, but the oppressor is working on your mind. And the enemy and fiery darts of things people have said are being shot at you and I daily so that we are in this constant battle of putting up that shield of faith, of having on that breastplate of righteousness, battling back with the sword of the Spirit, as the Bible says, so that you and I can stand and not only stand but go forward in the midst of all of these things around us and make it to the end and endure and see the kingdom. So. The world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. In verse 11, and these all having obtained a good report through faith. What does that mean? It's the same as those spies that went into the land. And two of those spies came back and said, we have a good report. Our God is able to give us this land. And so these men had a good report. Through faith, they believed God. And I know 
We're going through things today, all of us in our different lifestyles, in our different ways, with different family things and so on. Uh, we're going through trials and tribulations, and these are really, scripturally, they're light things compared to what these men went through. And according to the rewards that we have before us, they're very minute compared to what the Lord is going to give us. But for now, in this time and season, they can wear on our minds. They can be a heaviness on our heart. They can feel like a weight on our shoulders. They can cause us to take those deep sighing breaths over and over, wondering what's going to happen. Where is this going to end up? Are they ever going to learn or will they ever grow? Will things ever change? All these things that go on in our life. And they're normal, everyday things. But in this, you know, we have the victory through Jesus that he wants to take us all the way through. And so it says they obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. They didn't see what you and I are now promised, but they awaited that. And that they without us should not be made perfect. In other words, the kingdom isn't going to be complete until you and I are a part of all that. And they're not going to receive their rewards, rewards until we receive ours. You think about that. Now their patience, like we read in Revelation, they said, you know, how long, O Lord, how long? And then we talk about the patience of the saints waiting on the Lord to bring about what he's going to do, but they can't receive their blessings until we receive ours. So he says in verse 12, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, and many times we need to remember all of these men we read, read about, even the women, Deborah, you know, and different ones, Esther in the scripture for you ladies, and uh, all the way back, what they endured, what they encountered, what they went through, some of the fears that they faced, you know, to be exiled or to be executed by the king, Esther, to be executed uh, if she went against the king's command and so on. Great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. So tonight, if you just examine what you do and what I do, what we do, and what weighs us down. What are the weights that if I can just put this thing off and not have to battle this all the time, then I'm free to take on some other things that the Lord may have. To lay aside every weight and sin that does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Do you know every one of you has a course that you're going to go through in life? And your course is going to be different than everybody else's course in life. When I think about this run in the race, it kept coming to my mind about the, uh, how many of you, you've watched football, some of you ladies have watched it with your husbands maybe, or at a family gathering or whatever, and you know, the, the, the fella catches the ball, he runs, he's down, going down the sidelines, he goes all the way into the end zone, and then they say, well, wait a minute, uh, they called for a reassessment of what went on there, and so they go back and they're going to show you what happened from a different angle, and they look down and you see his foot and well from here it looks like he went out of bounds and then they bring another camera in and you look from that side well it looks like he was in bounds from here and then they look at another one and you know you get a flash of this one and a flash of that one and this one and that one and there's the guy and look he moved this way and well it could be that he and so on and so we're all in just waiting to see whether the score the goal really counts it's really a touchdown or not wouldn't you hate to live your life where the lord has to go back and replay where you went out of bounds or did you go out of bounds or 
You know, these good works that some people do, and then you go back and you find they really weren't good at all because this was involved and that was involved and so on. And so he says that we're to run this race. Live life in bounds. In other words, there doesn't have to be a replay to go back to see if we went out of bounds or not. And the Bible tells us in other places that he who runs a race uh, to go to get the prize, we've got to run lawfully. We've got to go accordingly uh, and so on. So let us lay aside every sin or every weight and sin that does beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Again, you've all got a different race than I do. Uh, some days it may seem like my race is almost nothing, like I'm going downhill all the time. Uh, and your race may seem like you're going uphill all the time. It's a constant battle. I guess we should reverse those roles because I feel like mine's always an uphill battle. And I look at other folks and say, well, gee, it looks like they're just coasting through life. They're just jogging this race. And there I am huffing and puffing and trying to get up the top of the hill and so on. And, and do you remember we showed the little movie about the uh, young racers and the coach kept telling them she had a reason for why they were going to do what they were doing and so on. A lot of good points in that movie. So he says, and let us run the race with patience. And again, there are those who are sprinters. There are those who run a 220, those who run a 440, you know, those who run a mile. There's the marathons and so on. And so in all these things, you have to pace yourself and run with patience, knowing that there's a lot of ground between me and the end of that before I cross that finish line before I can get any kind of prize or place or qualify or whatever the case may be. I've got to stay in here and be patient and it may look like a lot of folks are ahead of me, but you know, I just got to keep my pace. I got to keep going forward. And with a lot of things right now, there's a lot of folks stepping away from the Lord. There's a lot of people getting out of the race. Uh, but the main thing is, you know, you want to cross the finish line, right? You've all seen the ribbon stretched across the, the finish line. You want to break that ribbon. But for us, that's not the end of it. We're to have our eyes, like it says here, looking unto Jesus. In other words, I'm going to cross that ribbon. I'm going to break that ribbon or somebody's going to break it before me. But that's not my prize. The Bible tells me our prize is Christ to keep looking to him past the ribbon, past the end of the track, past everything that we see, you know, all the glitz and glamour, whatever goes on there. He's the prize. And Paul said, you know, I, I uh, leave those things which are behind in Philippians. I press toward the mark, which is the high calling that is in Christ Jesus, the high calling of God in Christ. In other words, I can see the Lord and I'm happy to make it into the kingdom, but really the prize is seeing Christ in his fullness, the one who paid the price for our sins, the one who suffered for us, the one who, as the Bible says, endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. So crossing the line, you know, I'm going to be wiped out from running and and huffing and puffing and my legs may cramp up and I may have chest pains and everything else. But when I see the prize, that's what we're running for. Not just to finish the race. We want to finish the race. We want to cross the goal line. We want to break the ribbon. But our prize is Christ. Because that's our rest. That's our refreshing. That's the salvation of our souls. He's the one who's laid all this out for us. He's the one who's kept us when there was nobody there with us. Nobody understood what we were going through or, you know, we weren't around everybody. It wasn't group fellowship or group therapy. It was Christ who ministered to us through his spirit here in the earth to lift us up, to keep us going 
to give us a second wind in the race when one day we were thinking, you know, maybe I'm not going to make it. It's not terrible to have those thoughts. It's time to say, Lord, you're able to keep me. Lord, you're able to get me through. You're able to pick me up. I do feel like I can't make it sometimes, but thank you that you get me through again and again, over and over. Amen? Amen. Looking unto Jesus. So running the race, running it with patience, knowing that, listen, let's say life, just as an example. I'm 66, I'll be 67 years old. Um, I keep telling myself, listen, I got to take care of some things because I might make it to 86 years old if the Lord doesn't come before then. So, or if I don't pass before then, of course, but if I make it 86 years old, what's the last 20 years going to be like? I want to make sure or try to do what I can to keep myself in a lot of ways, physically, mentally, you know, uh, and so on. That's, you, you plan ahead. Oh, and I meant to say, let me come back to that. I meant to say, how many of you remember when I talked about the alarm clock on Sunday morning? And anybody out there listening, I realized after I got through all of that, I forgot to say at one point, you do know I'm kidding. When I said about having the alarm clock right next to your bed, so I hope nobody was offended, nobody called me, a couple of the women, a couple of the women said, well, since you said that, I went home and took my husband's alarm clock and put it downstairs next to the intercom system so he'd have to get up and get busy about doing some things around our house. But no, I said about if you have your alarm clock next to your bed, you know why you do that. It's because you're lazy. And I know you're not lazy, and I hope nobody was offended by that because for some of you, 35 years or so, you got up and went to work with that alarm clock next to your bed. I said, I put mine in the other room, though, so I have to get up uh, to get started in the day. So now the men are all back at peace because they were all offended. They didn't want to say anything, but I heard they were talking to each other. So I didn't hear that. I'm just kidding about that, too. So running the race with patience. Think about where you are today and what if you and I all live another 20 years? Are you thinking of things like, of course, you think like financially, I have to be able to take care of things. Are you thinking about, you know, my health? Are you thinking about, you know, my marriage and husband, wife things and so on? Uh, my kids 20 years from now, how will they be talking to me and treating me? And how will I be dealing with them and everything? Running all this race with patience and where will we be if that's the case then and how will life be then because it looks like life has changed quite a bit recently so all of a sudden everything's starting to open up i hear and i know we talked about that briefly that uh some are saying that a lot of things that they wanted to accomplish they the they the they's of life you know they everybody says well who are they well, they're they, them, you know, them. Yeah, they've accomplished what they wanted to accomplish in a lot of areas. And so there's been a lot of changes and laws and things that have been done and people that have been sort of uh, blocked out. Uh, and so that now we'll just go along with this. And there is something else coming up, right? Oh, the election. There's an election in November. Uh, and so it has a lot to do with some of that, they say, too. So we don't know all the details about that. And some people say we shouldn't get involved in any of that. Say you shouldn't talk about politics and religion, but those are the only two things you should ever really be living for. The politics determines how you're going to live here in the earth, and your religious beliefs dictate to how you're going to live after this life's over, whether it's with the Lord in the kingdom or separate of the Lord and separate of the kingdom, which is not good. It's described as hell. So run the race with patience, the one that's set before us. So every one of you have a race that you're running, however you're to run it, 
you know, and I know I can offer advice and other people can offer advice and they can offer me advice and you can offer advice. But in the long run, we've got to ask the Lord because remember when Paul said, we're not those who commend ourselves among ourselves. I could say, well, you're ahead of me in the race. Of course, I'm number 99 out of 100, so that don't put you way up there, right? <laughs> so if you look at where I'm at and how I'm running, uh, that may mean basically nothing. You don't qualify for much of anything. By the time you get to the ribbon, everybody else has already cleaned up and gone home. So in a lot of that, Paul says we aren't to commend ourselves among ourselves because that's foolish. He says we're to line our lives up with the Lord and what he shows us in the scripture. And even to say, well, I'm doing more than Paul. Well, that doesn't really mean that you're doing all that the Lord has for you to do, even though you're doing more than Paul did. You're writing Bibles and stuff, like I talked about the fellow Sunday morning that wrote a Bible and uh, interpreted it all himself, and he'd been to heaven, so of course he knows everything about what's going on there. Uh, and so you go like, well, gee. He says we're to run the race with patience. We're seeing a lot of stuff we've never seen before. Patience is really a virtue. We know that, right? He says it's one of those things we're to add to our faith and so on. And so to be patient, even though we're seeing craziness, as we would know, and people going totally awry of things, and things dramatically changing, well, Lord, you said these things were going to come about, so we just have to continue and be patient, waiting on the coming of the Lord, and working and laboring in the process. So... Run with patience, or we, run with patience. Yeah, the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one that wrote it all. You know, a lot of people are coming up with a lot of things. I was reading a uh, mission statement from a church out on the West Coast, and when you read through the terminologies and the wordings, and a lot of them are doing this nowadays, they want to be all-inclusive. Now, we're all-inclusive. Anybody can come to church, right? We don't forbid anybody from coming. But you need to submit to this gospel and the ways of Christ doesn't mean you can keep your lifestyle because he told even us we had to give up our lifestyle so whatever lifestyle you're living he says you've got to be willing to deny yourself and i think i might have mentioned this at the prayer meeting saturday morning that deny yourself doesn't mean just say okay i won't do some things i like anymore no it means you're to see yourself as trash and that goes against all this new you know, you're beautiful the way you are, and you know, God loves you the way you are, which he does, but he wants to change you because if you're not changed, you can't enter the kingdom. The Bible says at one point, when they were debating about whether to be circumcised in the flesh or not, he said it's not about circumcision of the flesh or uncircumcision of the flesh, it's about a new creature, which is in Christ Jesus. That means every one of us, whether we physically are circumcised or not, we have to become a new creation to enter into the kingdom. Uh, one of the things we talked about, we talked about putting off some things, I think, last week uh, in some areas, though he tells us what we're to put on. And in Corinthians 15, he tells us that this mortal is going to put on immortality. It says, actually, in 1553, this corruptible must, 1 Corinthians 15, 53, this corruptible must put on incorruption. So that's why I wonder about a lot of these folks that are traveling back and forth into heaven. How does that work? I don't know. And I maybe I'm a little negative about it. Uh, he tells us we're to put on the new man in Ephesians 4.24. 
which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. See, this new man is nothing like the old man because the old man was foul, foul mouthed, thought evil and wickedness, plotted and planned. But it says, put on the new man in Ephesians 4.24, which after God is created, created. The new man we're putting on and have put on and are walking in is created in righteousness and true holiness. Not a, not a uh, false humility type thing, not a holiness that is verbal, but no actions and deeds. It's true holiness. And then it says in Colossians 3.10 that we have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge. We talked about uh, James last week and the week before a little bit about the knowledge which is from above and the knowledge which is earthly and sensual and devilish. It says here, we put on the new man which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, which is God. We're renewed in knowledge after the image of Christ, after the image of God. And then he says we're to put on, and this is what a lot of folks need to work on in the churches, and I mean all of us, in, first, or in Colossians 3.12, he says if we're the elect of God, he says put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, that means we're living in holiness and we're beloved of the Father. He says that we're to put on bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind. That means in our minds, there's no, will I'll get you later thought or eh, I never liked you anyway thought. Humbleness of mind. I mentally don't ascend to a place of supremacy. He says we're to put on bowels of mercies. Sometimes we get a little weary of people and things and we lose our mercy. We forget that we've been shown mercy over and over and over again. And kindness and humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering which means we put up with things for a long time believing waiting praying trusting running our race with patience looking unto jesus the author and the finisher of our faith he's the author of our faith because he is the word in the flesh so what we're reading is his authorship of what we are to live to make it into the kingdom. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Remember, he finished our faith at the cross. All we do is believe and obey and walk and follow. And he says there's going to be a time we're not going to need faith anymore because that will have been finished. We'll be with him in the kingdom. And he finished our faith by defeating the works of darkness, the powers and the principalities that you and I still battle, but we have the victory over because of what Christ did, because he's the finisher of our faith on the cross. It is finished. The debt is paid. The Lord is satisfied. All things are now complete who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. You know, you can put up with a lot of things when you realize, you know what, Lord? You're on the other side of all of this. Making it to the end of this race, it's been tough, it's been hard, but I can handle all of this because I know you're there at the end. And some days you may say, I can almost see the Lord there, um, going through things, you know, like, again, we talk about Stephen there in the book of Acts when he was being stoned and saw the Lord, uh, saw him standing. And uh, 
For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. I don't know how you're faring as far as all the craziness that's going on right now. But if you really are putting your hope and trust in the Lord, oh, it, it grieves you at times. It saddens you at times. It saddens to see people uh, go off the deep end of things and, you know, become full of anger and hatred and, you know, maybe, uh, you know, imagining things that you say, where did you ever get that from? Um, I can't believe you talk that way or think that way or think that way of me. I was with a fellow earlier today who said about a lot of things he did for a certain person, and he said, and then the person started to accuse me of things. And he said, I, I said to him, hey, do you remember it's me? And you know, you think about that type of thing, but we have this all before us. The world doesn't have that. We have Christ set there before us so that we can... For the joy that is set before us, endure being crucified, endure the cross. What, what are we saying? Good became evil, was hanging on the cross. Cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree. So what was good was now made a curse. And he says evil will become good and good will become evil. So we shouldn't be caught off guard with any of that knowing that this is what the Lord went through himself as our example. So because he knew he was going and he said to the disciples, I go to my father, he endured it all for that joy. He despised the shame, you know. Hey, look, just as churches, as, as some of us and some of us pastors and pastors we know and and I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you a list of a lot of pastors. I'm going to ask you to pray for them all uh, because we've been having more and more pastors come into our meeting. Uh, but they need prayer. And uh, anyway, he despised the shame. And a lot of things you see happening out here, you can have that same despising of because this is terrible that this has happened that people look at everything this way now, that they can't see, like how many times I've said to people, have you forgotten the thousands of people that came through these doors, that repented of their sins, that their lifestyles were changed, their hearts were changed, uh, all of a sudden people liked them because the Lord had come into their lives? We can't forget all that. And then you have people that have dastardly things they want to do to the church and say against the church and uh, even if there were problems or anything like that but how about all the souls that were saved how about all the people that have a knowledge of the truth and some fear or understanding of God because of where they were and you can take any church and say the same thing uh, we've watched major denominations right here locally where had major major problems things that people said how could they ever do that well people are people and people can fall and that's why we don't set people on pedestals we worship Christ and we follow men because men are supposed to lead us in the right ways of the Lord and pray that we always do so keep looking to Jesus. He's the author. He wrote all this for us. He gave us these guidelines. He gave us the commandments, the truths, the laws, the things to abide by, the things that will save us in the end and showed us and wrote out for us. These things will hurt you in the end. Don't follow those. who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, knowing there's so much more after all this, right? This is not the end of our life. When I take my last breath on this earth, it's not the end of me. It's the beginning of the whole new life in Christ. If I finish this race lawfully, which means in Christ Jesus, and have not run back into the world, Remember those other people that said, you know, why is it that you don't run with us anymore? Because I'm running this course now. 
despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God, the highest place. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, did nothing but good, was reviled as evil, hated, mocked, ridiculed, died the most horrific death, cursed, as the Bible says, is he that hangs on a tree. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, raised the dead, healed children, adults, straightened the crooked back of the woman, the lame walked, the blind saw, stopped the storms, fed the people, all the things that Christ did. Contradiction of sinners, that means a hostility, a reviling against, a hatred towards, of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. And stop and think about what have we really gone through that we could compare to any of this. We might be mad because they didn't give us Gatorade along the, run, the running of our race. And that's the terrible thing. Or I could have had better tennis shoes or spikes or whatever you wore. Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Since you all have come to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, have you ever done anything that you thought people should just lambaste you for? Oh, don't shake your heads. I can see everybody's going, oh, I'm not moving. Uh, or done things that, you know what, you cried and cried and cried, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me, Lord, forgive me. Why did I do that? Why did I act that way? Why am I here? He didn't do any of that. He didn't rise up in a evil against his neighbors or against the people or his own family who at one point in time they thought he was beside himself. He didn't mistreat them. He endured all that along with all the other people, his disciples forsaking him at the very end. Uh, isn't that when you should stick with somebody when they're in their worst time? It's nice to be friends and fellowship and, you know, getting to share with some of the men there that, uh, you know, in our church, you were a mixed church, there's ethnicity, whatever. Um, we fellowship together, we travel together, we go to dinners and things together. Some of you babysat each other's children and the whole thing. I said we were told once we were the only New Testament church. One of these men that taught on the New Testament church said he ever saw. But what happens with that? It's a great compliment, but do we continue in that? Do we keep that up? Do we teach other people that that's where we were and what we're about? Consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself. Do you think you've ever taken it personal when somebody's lashed out at you? I was accused of that once in a major way, and then I found out it was personal. So sometimes it is. But to be always thinking it's against me personal, it's against me personal, it's against me personal, that's an inferiority. Either that or it's a God complex. You think, like, I'm God and they're challenging me. And all of that stuff. Remember it says about, uh, what was it? Put on bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind. And so that you don't even go to those thoughts anymore. That's when you realize how blessed we are. Despising the shame is set down at the right hand of God of the throne of God, consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye uh, be wearied and faint in your minds because you and I have not yet resisted unto blood. Amen? And then over in Hebrews 12, 15, 14 and 15, 
It says, you and I are to follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. You know, I talk about some of the other religious orders and things and some of the things that are behind them and what they are looking to accomplish in the world and world dominance and some who are out there right now killing people and uh, doing horrific things and people say, well, you hate them, you hate them. And I can honestly say I don't hate them, but I'm not going to stop telling people to beware because that's what they'll do to you. That's where their hearts are. Uh, they actually hate you while you're being accused of hating them. I don't hate cars because I tell people not to walk in front of cars. I'm warning you that if you walk in front of a fast moving car, it can kill you or will kill you. And so it doesn't mean I hate cars. Pretty simple as far as I, of course I'm pretty simple as far as thinking things out anyway. Follow peace with all men. In other words, we're trying to bring anybody that will listen to the understanding of the gospel, to saving grace, to find the mercy of God, to be able to have the joy of the Lord, to be able to make it through all this thing in life without, it talks here about the root of bitterness and various things up a little further ahead of 14 and 15 here, uh, or afterwards, I forget which, but because so many people right now are becoming very, very bitter. They're becoming hateful over whether you wore a mask or not, whether you got a vaccine or not, whether you got within six feet of me or not, uh, whether you serve my food this way, that way. I mean, everything is becoming hateful out here. And this is all the works of darkness being manifest in the earth. And remember, the Bible tells us that is going to get worse and worse as we go. But he still says to us that we're to follow peace. We're to try to be at peace with all men. You remember I shared with you a little bit ago, maybe a month and a half or so ago, that I had driven up to Cleveland to meet a man and I had to give him this piece uh, for some equipment and so on. And I started talking to him and he started talking to me and we were talking about the Lord and what he believes and so on. And I suddenly saw in his eyes this look and I said, well, I'm not going to go any further with this right now because I can see he's not about following peace with all men. He's about to explode. So I just said, well, I'm just going to leave it right here at that. And I said, hey, listen, said his name. It was nice talking to you. I'm glad I got to meet with you. Maybe I'll be up here. I'll stop at your shop now that you told me where it's at and so on. Got in my car and drove away. I didn't need a ruckus on the street corner in Cleveland where I don't know anybody. Following peace with all men and holiness, holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Everybody is required to enter into this holiness. The Bible says, he said, be holy for I am holy. That's not legalism and that's not hypocrisy. Uh, it's not pharisaical. There's a lot of verbiage out there today. Uh, it's not patriarchal. It's the gospel. Without holiness, he says, no man shall see the Lord. And then he says, looking diligently, lest any man fail. So he told us to look to Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. And there he says, looking diligently, lest any man fail fail of the grace of God. I don't want to fail of the grace of God. I want to look more and more diligently as we go and see the Lord, like I said, beyond the ribbon in the race that I'm running. That's going to be a great thing to break that ribbon, but that's not the end of it. Seeing him face to face, as the Bible says, is the end of it all. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, and least any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. So all of us, that's why I've tried to say from the beginning of this onset 
of the pandemic thing, mask or no mask, vaccine or no vaccine, you know, remember, you're the saints, the body of Christ. You're to be at peace, like I read uh, last Wednesday night, I believe it was, amongst yourselves. Don't let the world be used with the fiery darts of the enemy to put wedges and devices in here and separate everybody. And that's going to happen to a lot of folks who aren't listening whatsoever and aren't in the fellowship. But that root of bitterness and so you begin to fail of the grace of God. In other words, the grace of God being the influence of God upon your heart. You're now biting in bitterness because these fiery darts have penetrated. And they've got you looking at things and segregating things and separating things and uh, excommunicating things and so on based on what these fiery darts are doing and what the root of bitterness is doing that's springing up and troubling you. And so at some point in time, then you can't keep it suppressed anymore. You got to let it out. You're going to tell other people. You're going to gather other people. You're going to get them together. And that's what you see in a lot of, you call them church splits. That's actually what happens. Somebody got a bitterness about something and they can't seclude it because it's going to come out. What's in there is going to come out. And so suddenly they gather other people, they talk to other people, and something goes awry. So the Bible tells us that we who are in Christ are blessed to the Lord. And Ephesians 6, 11 says that we're to put on the whole armor of God that we may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Amen? Live life in bounds. Don't make the Lord, and I know this is not what God does, have to go back and do a replay from every angle to see it if you're worthy of making it into the kingdom. Does that make sense? I mean, I know he doesn't have to do that. He knows it all. But as we can see it, that we've got to see it from this angle and that angle and zoom in and check to see was the line a little bit out of kilter there that, you know, he might have stepped on or off of all the way through. Amen? And walk with the Lord. Keep following the Lord in the midst of all this. Pretty soon spring's going to break. Birds are already chirping and singing. They're early for some reason. Uh, we're going to have a little spring break here, and then all of a sudden it's going to get cold again. And this on top of everything else, more snow than we've had in years. I said to a fellow that was asking about a snowblower, and I said, well, you can go look, but you're not going to find them anywhere. People, remember when I said about set the alarm so you can sound the alarm early? You know, my alarm went off at 10.50, uh, I think it was, or something like that, instead of, 10 after 5, and so I'm already about what we're doing, and I'm way past getting up and get cleaned up and getting ready. So people waited till we already had a foot of snow, and they were running to stores, and there were no shovels left either. People couldn't even buy a snow shovel. It's a great time to make money if you got a shovel or a snow blower, so I'm thinking for next year, uh, anyway, what I said was we had that big snow blower here and nobody really ran it and we only used it twice or three times in years and so we went ahead and sold it and then all of a sudden we got all this snow. I could have been up there on the roof running the snow blower and got all that off of there with no trouble whatsoever. So there are seasons for everything. You want to buy a snowblower before it snows. You want to buy a lawnmower before your grass gets a foot high. You want to buy clothes and things that you need when they're on sale, when you can save money. Don't wait till how many people go shopping for a suit because now they have to go to a wedding or a funeral. Buy one ahead of time. It's a lot less expensive that way. All kinds of things. Amen? Get Jesus before he comes again. Because the Bible says one day people are going to knock on the door saying, let me in, and it's going to be too late. The door is going to be shut. 
And the proof of that is Noah and the ark because once Noah and his family got in there as God commanded them to do, God sealed the door shut and there was no more getting in. Believe on the Lord Jesus, he said. Uh, get in a church, get yourself a Bible, ask God to forgive you of your sins, ask him to come into your life, give him your life. You'll see he knows what goes on. He knows how to help you and get you through all these things. It'll be way better than what you could have done. Amen. God bless.